How are you tonight? Good, it's good to see you. I want to say hi to everybody watching online too and all of our campuses. And welcome to 40 Days of Transformation. Actually, it's 50 Days of Transformation. I have been uh, excited about this. I've been working on this series for almost two years. And I want you to know that I'm more excited about where we're going in the next 50 days than anything since we did 40 Days of Purpose uh, many years ago. If you'll take out your message notes inside your program, our theme verse for the next 50 days is gonna be Romans chapter 12, verse two. Romans 12, verse two is gonna be our memory verse for this week. And uh, it's here on the screens, and it's also on the walls on either side, because I want you to learn and memorize this verse. Let's read it aloud together, Romans 12, two. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Okay, let's read it again. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. God wants you to be a nonconformist. He wants you to be a nonconformist. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed. You'll either be conformed or you're gonna be transformed. You see, God created you to be unique. God created you to be special. God created you to be like nobody else. You have a unique voice print, thumbprint, handprint, heartbeat. God doesn't make clones, man does, but God doesn't make clones. And God says, I want you to be unique, not conform to anybody else's idea of what you should be. But the problem is we all start off as originals, but we end up as copies of other people. And, and, and we get conformed and we get pressured and we get pushed into a, into a mold. Now during the next seven weeks, we're gonna look at seven key areas of your life and the changes that you need to make, want to make, and can make because of God's power in your life. We're gonna look at your uh, spiritual health, we're gonna look at your physical health, mental health, emotional health. We're gonna talk about transforming the way you think, transforming the way you feel. We're gonna talk about uh, financial health, transforming the way you look, and use, look at and use money. Relationships, relational health, vocational health, your career, and where you're going for the rest of your life. Now I wanna begin uh, this 50 days by explaining to you the big picture of what is a campaign, because some of you are new to Saddleback, and you're going, well, what is this? We do this every year in January and February. We'll do a 40 days of peace, or 50 days of faith, or 40 days of love, and 50 days of your calling, and we, we do these over and over uh, once a year. We've done them almost every year. Saddleback invented this idea of a campaign, and I wanna to explain to you why we do what we do. The first reason is because we all learn differently. The person sitting next to you has a different learning style than you do. That's why, uh, you know, in school, you know, if you happen to have the learning style that school teaches, you're gonna get straight A's in school. Doesn't mean you're smarter than anybody else, it just means you understand how to do what they want you to do there. But I've known a lot of people who totally flunked out of school and are brilliant because there's lots of different kinds of intelligence and there's lots of different kinds of learning styles and schools tend to only teach one style. So if you didn't do good in school, don't worry about it. Doesn't mean anything about your character, doesn't mean anything about your life, it just means you didn't fit that particular learning style of how to read something in a book and then write it over here. Some people are audio learners. learners. They're audible learners, they learn through the ear gate. They learn by listening. That's how they learn. They listen and they learn. Now, if you're an audible learner, you love church because this is the primary style we use at church. We're doing it right now. I'm talking, you're listening. You sit still while I instill. And if you're an audible learner and you learn through the ear gate, you love church and you're picking up stuff right now, you're already learning things as I talk to you. Others of you, it's going in one ear and right out the other because you're not an audible uh, learner. Some people say, no, I don't like to listen, but I like to read it, or I like to see it. I'm a visual learner. And some of you are visual learners. You, you say, show me a movie about it. 
Uh, let me see it in action. Let me read it. Let me watch it. And if you do that, you are a visual learner. And some people are visual learners. And they learn through art and things like that. Then there are other people who say, no, I don't like to listen. And I don't like to read. But I do like to talk. And there's nothing wrong with that. It's just a different learning style. And talkers are oral learners. And if you're an oral learner, you actually figure out what you believe by talking about it. And, and if you're an oral learner, you love small groups. Why? Because in small groups, you don't just have to listen, you get to talk. And a lot of people, they actually figure out what they believe. They figure out their, their convictions. They figure out their, their, their beliefs, their theology, by actually talking it out. And their, their brain doesn't really work unless they're talking. It kind of comes through their mouth. And as you talk, you, that's how you form your concepts. And those of you who think that way know exactly what I'm talking about. So some are uh, or, uh, ear, ear learners, they're audible learners, and some are eye gate learners, they're, they're visual learners, and some are um, oral, that you learn through the mouth. But there are some people who say, I don't like to listen, and I don't like to read, and I don't like to talk. They're called men. <laughs> okay, can I get an amen from the men? Yeah, okay. Men tend to be kinetic learners. We learn through our hands. There's not a single guy who's ever learned how to play, a foot, play football by reading a manual on it. Not one. It's done. Let's just go out and start throwing me some passes. Let's go out and, and shoot some hoops. Uh, let's go out and, and play catch. Uh, uh, you know, let's go out and, and drive some golf balls. You learn by doing. And, and when there's a problem in your car, say, so let me get under the hood here. I'll figure it out. And, uh, you know, here's a carburetor and all, all no 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 I don't need a manual what do you think I'm a man I'm not just let me play around here okay or you say you know I've got 50 wires coming into this uh, uh, audio system and uh, I, I need to figure out how to I, I don't need a manual I'll just play around with it I'll figure out how to install this app I'll figure out how to how to, how to uh, boot up this computer and you just do it by doing it you learn by doing all of these are appropriate styles I got to thinking many, many years ago, what if we took all these styles and applied it to your spiritual growth, and what if once a year we used every style to teach the same truth? So you hear it in a sermon, you watch it on a video, you read it in a book, you talk about it in a small group, you do it in a project, and you memorize it in, in a verse. And that's called a campaign. And when we started doing these, I discovered that people in our church were growing like this enormously faster than if we just did a sermon series on it. Does that make sense? That we learn in different styles, and when you use all the styles, you learn faster. The other thing is that we learn better by reinforcement. If you only hear it, you're not going to remember it. Studies have shown, the U.S. Air Force did a study that shows that we forget 90 to 95% of everything we hear in 72 hours. Now, if you want a statistic to depress the average pastor, that's it. Because that means you know, in, 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 in 72 hours, you will have forgotten everything I've just said. Unless you write it down, which is why I never teach without one of these. Because this helps you remember. The shortest pencil is longer than the longest memory, and when you take notes, you at least have something you can go back and look at, which is why Saddleback always uses these, to help you remember. I'll tell you a funny story. There's a high school teacher here in the Saddleback Valley who will go unnamed, but he's been at Saddleback for many, many years, and he said uh, one day his teenage daughter and her friends had borrowed his car, and they were going out for a joy ride, and they got in an accident. And when she called, uh, and she said, Dad, I'm all right. So then once he was not afraid that they were hurt, injured, he knew they were okay, uh, he then started to get a little angry. Like, Why were you goofing off? Why did you ding up the car and you know, smash in the front end? And so he said he drove down to where the accident was, and he was sitting on the um, sidewalk waiting for the AAA car to come and tow off his car. And he said, the longer I sat there, the more my temper began to get more intense and he said I looked down in the gutter and there was a piece of paper floating along that I, I, I recognized and he said I pulled it out and it was 
a Saddleback note. And he said, the title of the sermon was How to Defuse Your Anger. <laughs> he said, Rick, does God really do that? I said, God really does. And he, he pulled out, he said, watch this. And he pulled out his wallet. He had, it, had that note folded up. He said, I've kept it in my wallet ever since now for a couple years. So we forget 95% in 72 hours. So if you're not taking notes, you're just forgetting it. You may look real spiritual while I'm sitting here talking to you, but you're not going to remember anything I say, ultimately. And, and that depresses me as a pastor because I spend a lot of time studying. You know, it takes me about 16, maybe 18 hours to uh, pre prepare a typical message. And uh, so uh, all week I'm studying a little bit every day and I'm gathering these little pearls of wisdom from God's word that I'm going to share with you. And then I get up here on the weekend and I say, okay, you guys, here's my first pearl of wisdom from God's word. And I throw that pearl out and it comes out and just hits you on the head and goes boing and bounces right off. I said, here's another little pearl of wisdom, and I throw it out over here, and it goes boing, and it bounces right off, and you may look really good, and you may even be saying amen, or praise the Lord, or wow, that's good, but it's going in one ear and out the next, because you don't remember it. You could have sat under my ministry your entire life. Maybe you're 25 years old, and you've been at Saddleback your entire life. You've forgotten 95% of what I've said. So we've got to figure out a way to increase that. And the way you increase it is multiple repetition. You hear it, you read it, you watch it, you talk about it, you do it. All, hear, read, study, memorize, meditate, all those things. And when we do all those things together for an intensive period of time, we call it a campaign. Does that make sense? That's where we're going in the next seven weeks. And this is gonna be a very exciting time. Now, this notebook that you're gonna get in your small group uh, this little leatherette notebook says transformed and it has embossed the, the memory verse for, for the campaign. Everything uh, that we're going to do is in here. This is like an index for your spiritual growth emphasis for your next seven weeks. And, uh, you know, uh, I want you to bring it, this, bring this notebook. You're going to get one in your small group. Bring it to your group, but I also want you to bring it to church service for the next seven weeks. Because each week I'm going to be saying, hey, now turn to this page. And, and, and we're going to get some material out of that. Now turn over here. So I want you to bring this every week. And when I say turn to the page, by the way, the page numbers, you're going to say, all right, this thing's numbered. They're not at the top, and they're not at the bottom. The page numbers are right in the middle, and they're little tiny, and they're light blue. And we did that to frustrate you. <laughs> because I want you to learn patience during the next 50 days. But that's where, that's where it all is. Now let me explain to you where we're going. We're going to look at seven key areas of your life, but we also have seven key features that are going to help you grow. Let me put them here on the screen. The first thing you're going to do is you're going to watch eight video studies. You don't have to write this down because it's all, all in, in here. You're going to watch eight video studies in a small group. I wrote those studies and I taped them last summer about these key areas of life. Then the second thing you're going to do, and you're going to take notes on them, and the notes and the outlines are already in this book, so you're going to use this book for that. Second thing you're going to do is you're going to discuss what it means to you with a small group, and the discussion questions for each week are in this book. Then the third thing is you're going to read 50 short daily inspirations, daily devotions, and those 50 readings are in this book. Now, it doesn't take long. You can read them in about two minutes every day, three minutes every day. But the idea is to help you start a habit of a time with God every day. Fourth thing you're going to do is you're going to listen to seven weekend teachings that I'm going to teach over the next seven weeks. The fifth thing you're going to do is we're going to memorize a Bible verse each week. Why? Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against you. Memorizing scripture is the single most important thing you can do for your Christian life. I'll say it again. Memorizing scripture is the single most important thing you can do for your Christian life. It's the key to overcoming temptation. It's the key to witnessing. It's the key to everything else. The more you, word of God in your mind, the more God can change your life. So that's important. Now, this year, we're adding two new features that we've never, ever done at Saddleback before, and I'm very excited about it. Number six is we're going to download a transformed phone app. 
And we, our, our tech teams have put together, I just downloaded mine yesterday on my iPhone. If you have Android, it's on Android. You can go to saddleback.com slash, I'll tell you about it later, um, <laughs> slash uh, uh, series slash transform, and it'll give you the link. It's free, and I want you to put this on your phone because it not only has this material, but it also has additional material, so you'll have it with you for the next 50 days. And our guys have been working along to prepare that for you, and I'm grateful for them. The last thing we're going to do, and this is new, is set a personal goal in each of seven key areas of your life. So by the end of this 50 days, you will have a, a goal for what you want to be different in your relationships. A goal for what you want to be different in your, your work or your career or your job. A goal for how you want to be different with your relationship with the Lord. A goal about your own physical health. This is the secret sauce of change. And I'm going to talk about it this weekend. In other words, all of these seven things I just put on that screen, every one of those will help you become the woman God wants you to be or the man God wants you to be. But this last one, learning to write personal goals down, is really the special sauce for changing your life. So what we're gonna do tonight is I'm gonna teach you the first part of it on goal setting, and the second part of it you're gonna do in your small group this week. I've got a separate DVD I'm gonna give you that you'll watch in the DVD. What I wanna do today is explain to you why you must set goals for your life. And God says it. It's very clear in the Word of God why you must do it, and the changes it'll make in your life and the power that it will do. So this is all about the future. A lot of times we talk about problems and pressures in your life. This series is about your potential. This series is about your possibilities. This series is about your future, making the best of the rest of your life. So I'm very excited about it. Now, I wanna begin by giving you the six reasons why you need to learn how to set goals in your life. Would you write these down? Number one, the Bible says six things about goal setting. Number one, the Bible says that goal setting is a spiritual responsibility. Goal setting is a spiritual responsibility. Did you know that God sets goals? God has goals for the universe. God has goals for planet Earth. God has goals for history. God has goals for eternity, and God certainly has goals for your life. The Bible tells us that Jesus set goals. In fact, he often announced publicly what his next goal was. I'm going to do this now. I'm going to do this now. And I'm going to do this now. He publicly would announce in advance what his goal was for the next phase of his ministry. Every person who walked with God in the Bible, you can find examples of being goal-directed. But let me just give you one example. The Apostle Paul. On your outline, Philippians chapter three, it says this. I know that I'm not yet what God wants me to be. Hang on. Anybody agree with that? I know that I'm not yet what God wants me to be. I haven't reached that goal, but I keep moving toward it to make it mine because Christ made me and saved me for this. Now I know that I haven't reached my goal, but there is one thing I always do. Forgetting the past and straining toward what is ahead, I keep my eyes focused on the goal so that I may one day win the prize that God has called me to receive through Christ in the life above. Now all of you who are spiritually mature should think this same way too. I want you to circle three things. That goal, my goal, and the goal. Paul was goal oriented. He says, I haven't reached that goal. I haven't yet reached my goal. And my focus, my eyes are focused on the goal. Why is it important for you to set a goal? Because it's a spiritual responsibility. You're going to go through life either by design or by default. You're either going to set goals and you're going to decide what's important for your life or other people are going to decide it for you. If you don't have goals for your life, you are abdicating control of your life to somebody else and other things. 
If you don't have goals for your life, you're not living, you're just reacting. You're just existing. If you don't have clear goals for your life, you're just coasting through life. You are drifting through life. And whenever you're coasting, you're always going downhill. If you don't have goals for your life, you have already decided to let other people run your life. Because you don't know what's important, so you're gonna let them decide. And you react to circumstances, and you go through your whole life wasting your life because you haven't clarified what's important. This is a very important spiritual discipline. You, you, you're allowing others to direct your life. The Bible says to be spiritually mature. He says all of you who are spiritually mature should think the same way. I set my goal, I strive toward my goal, I move toward my goal, I keep my eyes focused on the goal. That's what Paul said, probably the greatest Christian who ever lived next to Jesus himself. Number two, goals are statements of faith. Goals are statements of faith. A lot of people think, well, goal, isn't that like a business thing? Isn't that like a secular thing? Isn't that a, like a, a, something athletes do? No, 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 no. This is a spiritual habit that you need to develop. And goals are statements of faith. In other words, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, when you set a goal, what you're saying is, I believe, that's faith, I believe that God wants me to accomplish such and such by such and such a time. That's a statement of faith. A goal is a statement of faith. This is what I believe God is gonna do in my life. Goals don't just be a, aren't just a statement of faith, they stretch your faith. And the bigger your goal, the more your faith will be stretched, and that pleases God. The Bible says without faith, it is impossible to please God. So if you don't have any goal, you don't need any faith. And if you don't need any faith, the Bible says it's impossible to please God. In fact, in Romans 14, it says, whatsoever is not a faith is sin. So if I'm going through life without having to have, need any faith. If I don't have any goals, I don't need to take any risks. And if I don't take any risks, I don't need any faith. And if I don't have any faith, I am being unfaithful. You see how important it is for you to have a goal in every area of your life? Now, here's a goal-stretching verse. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20. God can do anything. Far more than you could ever imagine. I don't know, I could imagine some big things. Far more than you could ever imagine, or guess, or dare to request in your wildest dreams. I don't know about you, but I can imagine some pretty big things. I'm a pretty big dreamer. Nobody has ever accused me of being a small thinker. I've always had big dreams. And yet God says, Rick, you think of the greatest thing, you, of the greatest dream I could do in your life, and guess what, I can top that. I can beat that. I, am, I can do anything far more than you would ever imagine or guess or dare to request in your wildest dream. Write this down. Let the size of your God determine the size of your goal. You let the size of God determine the size of my goal. Many years ago, when Saddleback decided to buy this land, it's 120 acres. Do you know how much that costs? Millions of dollars. To buy 120 acres in Orange County would seem like nonsense to most people. And, and when we, as a church, decided to buy this 120 acres for millions of dollars, because we, weren't, we were just not a very big church at the time, and I remember the word got out in the community that this little group of people called Saddleback was buying 120 acres. And the question was going through the community, who do they think they are? And I thought, that's the wrong question. The question is not who do we think we are. The question is who do we think God is? Who do we think God is? Big God, big goal. Tiny God, tiny goal. No God, no goal. Let the size of God determine the size of your goal. I guess what I want to say to you as your pastor, as somebody who loves you, and I want the best for your life, and I want you to succeed in life, is during the next 50 days, I dare you to dream great dreams. I dare you. Stop your puny little thinking. Stop being in a little bitty box. 
well, I'm too young, or I'm too old, or I'm not pretty enough, or I'm not handsome enough, or I'm a woman, or I'm a guy, or whatever. Stop all your arguments and start dreaming what God could do in your life if you would just trust him. To me, hell would be if God were to show me all I could have accomplished in my life if I just believed him a little bit more. That would be hell. We limit God by our unbelief. Now there are two common mistakes we make in goal setting. We set them too low and we try to accomplish them too quickly. As your pastor, I am urging you in the next 50 days and each week we're gonna set a goal in each of the seven areas. You'll set one for your area. I challenge you to dream big dreams for God and I challenge you to think bigger than you ever thought before so that you have to trust God. See, I live my life in such a way that I'm bound to fail unless God bails me out. I can't tell you how many times I've painted myself into a corner when everybody goes, who does he think he is? What is he? I mean, look at what he's trying to do. Like one time we said, hey, let's be the first church in 2,000 years to go to every nation. Nobody had ever done that. We did it. Why? Because we set a goal and God helped us. And, and, and I have spent my life dreaming great dreams and it's amazing what God can do in your life if you will do that. Now here's the cool thing. Dreaming doesn't cost anything. Doesn't cost you any money. Doesn't cost you a penny. You can dream great dreams. What do I dream about in my relationships? What do I dream about in my career? What do I dream about in my finances? What do I dream could happen in my relationship with God? How would I want to look? How healthy would I want to be? On the, all these things, dream great dreams. You see, we overestimate what we can do in a year and we underestimate what you can do in 10. So instead of thinking puny little tiny goals and trying to accomplish them instantly, my challenge to you is get a big goal for your life and then spend the rest of your life going after it. I did. When I was 25 years old and I moved here and started this church with no member, no money, nobody, and I, I set a 40-year goal for this church. When I was 25, that seemed like an eternity. Goals are statements of faith. By the way, the difference between a goal and a dream is you put a deadline on it. And you say, this is what I want to happen by 2020. This is what I want that, and that's what I did. In 1980, I set a goal to be accomplished by 2020. Now, if you don't have a date, a deadline on, on your goal, it's not a goal, it's just a dream. Now, dreams are good, but you need both. Now, here's what the Bible says, Matthew 9:29. According to your faith, it will be done to you. According to your faith, it will be done to you. God says, you get to choose how much I bless your life, how much I transform your life. Great faith will be great transformation. Nothing happens in your life till you start dreaming. God says, you get to choose. According to your life, your faith, it will be done. So I'm gonna encourage you that when we start setting one goal a week over the next seven weeks, don't miss any of these, that you, you ask the question, will this require me to have faith? Is it such a big dream that I'm bound to fail unless God helps me? I'm really going out on a limb. Don't ever be afraid to go out on a limb. That's where the fruit is. The fruit is not at the trunk. You don't get the fruit by playing it safe. It's out on the limb. And never be afraid to rock the boat if Jesus is your captain. I'm sharing you life experience tonight because I'm looking out on the next generation of Saddleback right here and I'm going, I want you to know God like I do and I want you to trust him like I do and I want you to be used by God in ways that you've never, ever imagined. I never imagined all of this, but God did. Goals are statements of faith. Number three, goals focus my energy. Well, another one of the reasons why you need to set goals in every area of your life is they focus your energy. They keep, keep you from wasting time, money, reputation, energy. They keep you focused. Selection is the name of the game. Focus is the key to an effective life. It's not these 50 things I dabble in. It's this one thing I do. And the more you focus your life, 
the more powerful, the more effective your life is gonna be. If you spread it out and diffuse your life over a whole bunch of different things, you'll make no impact at all. But if you focus your life, it's gonna be powerful, it's gonna be strong, and it will change the world. Light diffused has no power at all. But when you focus light, it has enormous power. The sun doesn't start, set things on fire just because it's diffused. But I remember when I was a kid, if you take a magnifying glass, you can, you can set grass on fire. Or you can burn little bugs. <laughs> I'm sure all you girls did that, right? And, and the, you focus the light, it, 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 it can actually start a fire. If you focus light even more, it becomes a laser. And a laser can cut through steel. And a laser can kill a cancer. I want you to live a laser life. A focused life. Goals focus my energy. Now, the world is full of distractions. Everybody agree with that? Everybody agree? There are a lot of things to distract you. You can spend your life, you can waste your life, or you can invest your life. And the greatest use of life is to invest in that which is gonna outlast it. Now, you don't have time to do everything. You figured that one out already. You don't have time to do everything. Here's the good news. God doesn't expect you to do everything. Not everything's worth doing. And there are only a few things that are really worth doing. And the key to being effective in life as a woman of God, as a man of God, is to do what matters most and forget everything else. Goals focus my life. Paul says this in 1 Corinthians 9, 26. I do not run without a goal. I fight like a boxer who is hitting something, not just the air. He said, I'm not playing around here. I'm not playing air guitar. I'm not just pretending I'm boxing. He goes, when I, when I box, I fight to win. When I run a race, I run to win. He said, I'm not just messing around here with my life. It's too important. I'm gonna do something with my life. I'm gonna win. I want my life to bring honor and glory to God. I don't run without a goal. Some of you are running without a goal. And as a result, you're just running in circles and you're caught up in the rat race. You don't wanna run the rat race, because even if you win the rat race, you're still a rat. <laughs> Number four, goals don't, they're, they're statements of faith, goals focus my energy. Number four, goals keep me going. They give me hope to keep moving. They give me hope to endure. They give me hope to persist. You know, you've heard me say this many times, when you're going through hell, what do you do? You keep going. You don't wanna make a home in hell. You don't wanna stay there and camp out overnight. When you're going through hell, you just keep on going. And the way you do that is you have a goal beyond. The Bible says Jesus endured the cross because he looked forward to the goal and the glory that was set before him. He looked beyond the pain to the payoff. You need to do this too. The Bible says that God wants to make you have hope. You see, if you don't have a goal in your life, any goals in your life, you don't really have any reason to get out of bed in the morning. Except maybe you gotta eat. Uh, but, but really, what's the, why, even, why, even, why, why even get out of bed? Why even live if you don't have any goal for your life? Job says this in Job chapter six, verse 11. I do not have the strength to endure. You ever felt like that? I, don't, I just, I don't know if I'm gonna make it. I don't have the strength to endure, why? Next sentence, I do not have a goal that encourages me to carry on. You gotta have a goal to keep you going. You know, they did a study once of um, the Holocaust survivors. And in World War II, you know, the Nazis killed six million Jews and many others besides Jews, many Christians, Muslims, gays, others, others that, that they just didn't lie. They put them all in the death camp. And they studied those who survived the Holocaust, survived those terrible uh, um, tragedies, and they discovered only one thing in common with all these people. Every one of them had something to look forward to. Every one of them had something waiting for them. Every one of them had something that they wanted to live for. They had a goal. 
Those who didn't have anything to live for, those who didn't have anything to look forward to, those who didn't have any goal out there, they lost hope and they simply gave up the will to live. And then they, then they died. The second year of this church, when I was 26 years old and pastoring, it was what I call my dark year. And I was depressed the entire year. And I could barely put one foot in front of the others. And I later went to a doctor and got some nutritional advice and, and I, I went out, but it took a full year before I actually felt better. I was just always tired and I was always depressed and I was just always fearful. And, I, and, and you know, at that time, I wasn't thinking God build a great church. I was thinking, can I just get through today? And I look back now and I'm, I'm, I'm grateful that I didn't give up that year. But I'm also more grateful that God didn't give up on me. And what kept me going full of, through a full one year of depression? I had a goal. I had made a commitment to pastor this church for 40 years. And so I held on to that even though every bone in my body wanted to give up. Do you want to know how often I felt like giving up as pastor of Saddleback Church? How often I felt like resigning? Just every Monday morning. I get PMS, <laughs> post-message syndrome. And after you've preached five or six or seven times and you're all emotionally spent, you get up the next day and you think, man, somebody could have done a better job than that. God, I, I'm not that smart. You gotta find somebody who can really, this church is too big for me. Get somebody else, get somebody who's brilliant to do this. But you just keep on keeping on, why? Because you have a goal. You see, when you have a long-term goal, long-term goals keep you from being discouraged with short-term setbacks. Everybody has setbacks. Everybody blows it. Everybody makes mistakes. Everybody has failure. In fact, failure is the only way you succeed. You cannot succeed in life without failing. Why? That's how you learn what works and what doesn't work. So never call it a failure, call it an education. Some of us are highly educated. <laughs> We're good at failing. Now, if there's any piece of advice as your friend, I could say this to you, it's this. Learn to fail fast. Okay? Because you're going to fail. You're going to fail. So everybody fails. I fail all the time. You know what? The key to Saddleback's growth and our strength and our, our success is we fail fast. And then we learn from it. We don't waste our failures. We try something, that doesn't work. We try something, that doesn't work. We try something else, that doesn't work. We try something else, that doesn't work. We do 99 things that don't work, and then number 100 works. And then we teach a seminar to other pastors and pretend like we knew what we were doing. <laughs> but we're not that smart. It's just trial and error. Goals keep me going, and long-term goals keep me from being discouraged about short-term setbacks. Now, a goal doesn't have to be big to motivate you. For instance, if you had to go to the hospital and have surgery for some, some reason, your first goal would simply be after surgery, can I sit up in bed? Not a very big goal, but an important one. And the second goal would, can I hang my feet over the side of the bed and sit up? And then the next goal would, can I get enough strength to stand up after surgery? And then a very important goal, can I have enough strength to go to the bathroom by myself? Big goal. Then next is, do I have enough strength to walk around this wing of the hospital? All of those are very small goals, but they're all important goals because when, to get from here to success isn't one big leap. It's many small steps. Many small steps. So a goal doesn't have to be big for it to be important. It's getting you on the way. Like my goal today is to get out of bed and to eat healthy, have a healthy breakfast. Fine, that's a good goal. Paul says in Philippians, excuse me, uh, the Bible says, as Job said, I have to have a goal to encourage me to carry on. Now, it, you may have come this weekend and you're a little discouraged. Maybe you're feeling a little down. Maybe you're feeling, you got the blues. You're down, 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 doobie doo, down, down. And, and you, everybody hates me, nobody loves me, I'm never gonna get married, I'm gonna go eat worms. 
I'm gonna play the song for you here. If you're discouraged this weekend, you need to set some new goals. And that's what we're gonna do in the next 50 days. You need to set some new goals in these different areas. Goal setting is a spiritual responsibility. It's a statement of faith. It focuses my energy. It keeps me going. Number five, the Bible says goals build my character. Goals build my character. Drifting doesn't build your character, but goals build your character. And if you, if you set a goal and you get a vision, without a vision, the Bible says the people perish. If you get a vision, you get a goal, then God says, I can work in you. Now, listen very clear, carefully what I'm about to say. The greatest benefit to your life over the goals you're gonna set in the next 50 days, the biggest benefit to your life is not gonna be the accomplishments and achievements you acquire because of those goals, but what happens inside you while you're moving toward the goal. See, God is more interested in your character than he is in your accomplishments. You're not taking your success to heaven. You're not taking your, um, your, your, your career to heaven, but you are taking your character. So God is more interested in who you are and what you become than he is in what you do and accomplish and what you succeed at. God's interested in you. You're, so here's the idea. While I'm working on the goal, God is working on me. Does that make sense? And that's what God wants to do in your life. Goals help build your character. And that's what's gonna last for eternity. That's why Paul says in Philippians chapter three, verse 12, I keep striving toward the goal. Circle the word striving. That means it takes energy. It takes <laughs> intention it takes purpose in order to reach your goal and God says that while you're doing that while you're working on the goal God is building character in you you will never become the man God intends you to be unless you intend to become that man you will never be the woman God intends for you to be unless you intend to be that person. 10 years from today, some of you, you're not gonna be in church, you're gonna be a long way away from God, you're gonna go through a failed marriage, you're gonna have all kinds of problems in your life. Why? Because you never intended to be a man of God. You never intended to be a woman of God. It was just kind of a casual Christianity. Yeah, maybe this, yeah, maybe that. And you never intended You'll never become what God intends without you being intentional. Goals build my character. And then number six, good goals will be rewarded. Good goals will be rewarded. And if you have good goals, then there's gonna be two reasons to, that you're rewarded. You're gonna be rewarded on earth by people and you're gonna be rewarded by God in heaven. When you have a good goal, it brings respect. When you have a good goal, it brings honor. When you, when you give your life to a good goal, it builds a legacy on earth. 
The Bible says in Proverbs 11, 27. Let's read this verse aloud together, okay? Read it with me. If your goals are good, you will be respected. Circle that, you will be respected. You wanna be respected? Then you need to set some goals that are good. Tomorrow, the entire nation will celebrate Martin Luther King Day. Why? Why do we take a holiday for one guy? Because he was a man who set good goals. And he didn't live for himself. He didn't live for greed. He didn't live for pleasure. He didn't live for popularity. He lived to fight injustice and to fight prejudice and to fight racism and to fight for truth. He set good goals for his life and so he is honored with a holiday. One of the greatest honors I've ever been given in my entire life was the honor of preaching in Martin Luther King's home church on the 40th anniversary of his death. And so on the 40th anniversary of Martin Luther King's death, on that day, they invited me to speak at Ebenezer Baptist Church in Atlanta. I was the first white preacher to preach in that church. And that was an honor to me, why? Because I respect people who use their lives to make a difference. And if you were to come to my study, you'd find a picture of Martin Luther King on the wall with a typed letter, signed letter underneath it. And you'd see another picture of Mother Teresa with a handwritten note underneath it. And you'd see a note from Billy Graham with a handwritten a note and many others. And some of these people on that wall are not Christians. They're not Christians. But I honor them, why? Because they gave their lives for the good of others. They had a goal greater than themselves. They didn't live a little selfish clod of a life living for, I wanna make a lot of money and retire. Oh yeah, you think God put you on earth to do that? Make a lot of money and retire? That's the whole purpose of life? Ah, wrong answer. God wants to teach you how to love. If your goals are good, you'll be respected. But the real reward in setting good goals is gonna come in eternity. Look at this next verse, 1 Corinthians 9, 25. All athletes practice strict self-control. Uh, you know, they eat right, and they sleep right, and they, they, um, they, you know, they work out, they exercise. They do it to win a prize that will fade away. Nobody's gonna remember yesterday's game in two weeks, much less two years. They do it to win a prize that will fade away, but we do it for an eternal prize. So, I run, Paul says, straight to the goal with purpose in every step. He was purpose-driven goal setter. You need to be that too. Now, not every goal that you can set is a good goal. Not every goal is a goal that God's gonna bless. So you wanna set goals in these seven areas over the next seven weeks. You wanna set these in your life, but you wanna set the kind of goal that God is gonna bless, God's gonna give you the power uh, to do. So how do I know the kind of goal that God will bless? Let me just close by giving you three questions. Write these down. When you get ready to set a goal, you wanna ask these three questions. Number one, the first question is, will this goal honor God? That's the first question you ask. Will this goal honor God? And what kind of goal will honor God? What kind of goal brings glory to God? Any goal that causes you to trust him more, to depend on him more, to love him more, to love other people more, to serve God and serve others, to be more unselfish, those are gonna be good goals. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians six twenty. God paid a great price for you. Look at the cross. So, use your body to honor God. Are you using your body to honor God? Are you using your body for pleasure, for selfish reasons? Use your body to honor God. You might circle that. By the way, it's not too late to join the Daniel plan. That's been kind of fun already in just the first three weeks. A lot of people seen major changes getting off some medications they had, feeling better, blood pressure going down, able to have more energy. People are already seeing some dramatic results. You could still join the Daniel plan. First Corinthians 10, 31. When you eat or drink 
or do anything, always do it to honor God. Everything can be done to honor God. You can take out the garbage to honor God. You can wash dishes to honor God. You can clean out your car to honor God or your closet. You can study it for a test to honor God. How? By doing it with the right motive out of gratitude and for the right motivation, I want my life to bring honor to God so I'm gonna be the best I can be for God's sake. Will this goal honor God? Now the Bible says this, we make it our goal to please him, 2 Corinthians 5, 9. Second question, will this goal, or is this goal motivated by love? That's the second thing you wanna ask when you set a goal for your finances, for your health, for your relationships, will this goal, is this goal motivated by love? God is not gonna bless a goal motivated by greed. I didn't wanna make a whole lot of money. God is not gonna bless a goal motivated by competition. I wanna be better than that company. God is not gonna bless a goal motivated by envy. God is not gonna bless a goal motivated by greed or grief or guilt or grudges. He's not gonna be, uh, uh, honor a, a, a goal that's built on worry or fear or anxiety. He, God is not going to bless a goal that's motivated by materialism or by ego, or by pride. But when you set a goal out of love, God, I wanna do this because I love you and I wanna love other people. God's gonna honor that because it's all about love. Life is all about learning how to love. 1 Corinthians 16, 14, everything you do must be done with love, everything. 1 Corinthians 14, 1, love must be your highest goal. That should be the number one goal in your life. I wanna learn to really love. And I want to learn to love unlovely people. And I want to learn to love the loveless and the unloved. And I want to learn to love people who are hard to love. That's being like God. Why is it important for you to have goals that are based on love? Because if you set loveless goals, you're going to treat people as projects. You're going to run all over them to get to your goal. You're going to run over your marriage. You're going to run over your friends. You're gonna run over the other people climbing up the ladder of success. And God says, no, no, you got it all wrong. It's not about accomplishments, it's about relationships. It's about learning how to love. Third thing, third question. Will this goal require depending on God? Will this goal require depending on God? Remember I said earlier, Hebrews 11:6, 6, without faith it's impossible to please God. If you don't have a goal that requires faith, then you're, it's not a pleasing to God goal. Romans 14, 23, everything that doesn't come from faith is sin. If you have a goal that's so small it doesn't require any faith to do it, it's a sin. Whatever is not a faith, the Bible says, is sin. Now look at this verse, Proverbs 16, verse nine. Why don't we read this one aloud too? Read it with me, Proverbs 16, nine. We plan the way we want to live, but only God makes us able to live it. I love that in the message paraphrase. That's what we're gonna do during 50 days of transformation. You get to plan the way you want to live. And, and this, this series is to help you make the rest of your life the best of your life. We get to plan the way we want to live, but it says only God gives us the power, gives us the energy, gives us the ability to actually do it, to make the transformation, why? Because God provides the three things you must have to reach your goal. Write these down. Three things you must have to meet your goal, three things you must have to change your life. Number one, I need God's spirit to empower me. This is not something based on willpower, it's based on God power. It's not based on trying, it's based on trusting. I need God's spirit to empower me. Zechariah 4, 6 says, you will succeed, you will not succeed, it says, you will not succeed by your own strength or your own power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. I need God's spirit to empower me to make changes I can't to make on my own. Number two, I need God's word to guide me. I need God's spirit to empower me. I need God's word to guide me. 
This book here, the Bible, is the owner's manual for life. The more you get this book into your mind, your heart, and your life, the more you read it, study it, memorize it, meditate on it, the more successful, the more fulfilled, the more strong you're going to be in life. When Joshua was given the great dream of taking over the promised land, and it was a goal that was gonna take him the rest of his life, God had these words to say to Joshua, chapter one, verse eight. Keep this book, that's the Bible, keep this book of the law on your lips. In other words, talk about it all the time. Recite it by day and night. That means memorize it so you can quote it. Recite it by day and night that you may carefully follow all that is written in it. That's the premise, now here's the promise. Then you will successfully attain your goal. might underline that last phrase. If you ever intend to be in business for yourself, you ought to memorize that verse. In fact, it would be a good verse for everybody to memorize. Keep this book of the law in your heart. Read it, memorize it, live it, practice it, study it, that you're careful to follow it and obey. Then you will be successful. You will attain your goal. That is one of the greatest promises of success in the Bible. And that promise doesn't come from Tony Robbins or some self-help guru. That promise comes from God. You will successfully attain your goal. How? If you become a man of the word, you become a woman of the word. All you need to know about life is in this book right here. I need God's spirit to empower me, and I need God's word to guide me. And finally, the third thing I need is I need God's people to support me. You will not be able to reach your goals on your own. I haven't been able to reach my goals on my own. It takes a team to fulfill a dream. You need other people in your life. This is why we insist that everybody in our church family be in a small group. You're never gonna feel like a part of our church till you're in a small group. A crowd can't support you, but a small group can. Three, four, five, six other people. They can know when you're sick. They can know when you're having a tough time, when you've had a bad day. A crowd can't support you, but a community, a small group can. Ecclesiastes 4.12 says this. By yourself, you're unprotected. It means it's like at a football game. You're unprotected. You're out there running down the field by yourself. You don't have anybody to block and tackle for you. There's nobody out there to protect you. If you're not in a small group, you don't have any block and tacklers. You don't have anybody who's gonna speak up for you, stand up for you. By yourself, you're unprotected. But with a friend, you can face the worst. Boy, did I learn that this last year. And a group of three, a group of three is even better because a rope braided with three strands is not easily snapped. What do you call three people meeting together? A small group. That's what it is. Jesus said, where two or three are gathered in my name, I'll be in the midst of them. Now, how many of you are in a small group? Can I see your hands? Most of you, yeah. If you're not in a small group, you will be by the time we end tonight. Because we've made it so simple, so easy, all you gotta do is get a friend or two friends and, and say, let's study this material together for the next 
50 days. I'm not asking you to do it the rest of your life. I'm saying just for the next 50 days. And if you're not in a group, here's what you need to do. You need to make a decision, take a step of faith, go, man, I don't want to miss this stuff. I mean, everybody else is going to do it. I don't want to miss this transformation. It's all built around the group. And to make that decision, to, to go get a friend or two friends or three friends or five friends, doesn't matter, and, and go out on the patio and say, I'm going to start a group. And we'll give you one of these kits. And in this kit, you get the books. These are free for everybody in your small group. You get the DVD study that I've done. You get the information on uh, the, uh, uh, the memory verses and on, on, on the app and stuff like that. And it's all in here. This is just add water and stir. This is hamburger helper for your spiritual life. Okay? It's goof proof. Anybody can do this. Okay? If you can read English, you can do this. All right? And you just go out and say, I'm, I'm going to start a group. Don't leave here tonight without, I mean, you are being given the opportunity of a lifetime. In about two weeks, thousands of other churches are going to start 50 days of transformation all across America because a lot of other churches do our, our campaign. But you're getting it at the original source. Do you think God brought you here to watch everybody else have their lives transformed? No. You need to start a group tonight. Now let me close with... Um, just a couple of action steps. Here's what I want you to do this week, two or three things. One, go download the app, okay? Download the, uh, the transformation app on your iPhone or your Android, your smartphone. Uh, it, here it is on the screen. You can go to saddleback.com slash series slash transformed and it'll take you to the links to download and this is gonna help you not just for the next 50 days but actually ongoing for uh, the rest of the entire year. And you just click on the icons above the Android or the Apple to, to, to download, okay? The second thing I want you to do is when you meet this week in your small group, I want you to take a picture of your small group and I want you to email it to me, okay? Now take a picture. Now, uh, if, 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 if somebody takes a picture, they're not obviously gonna be in it, so you might have to get your neighbor to take the picture or your dog or so, get somebody who's got the longest arm to take a selfie of your whole group, okay? And click that and then send it to me, pastorrick at saddleback.com. That's my email, pastorrick at saddleback.com. Because each week for the next 50 days, we're gonna put at all of our campuses pictures of small groups on the screen like, like this. Uh, and, uh, and, and you know, if your picture, you'll be a rock star. You will be, and it'll be seen all around the world because a lot of people are watching this service online right now around the world. And you'll one day be walking through London Airport, Heathrow, and somebody will say, hey, you're in a Saddleback small group. I saw your picture. <laughs> By the way, that picture that was just up there, those people, look at this. Th that's a group that came up for the host meeting on Friday. They started the first Saddleback uh, small group in San Diego. That's in San Diego. Yesterday on the patio, I was out on the patio, and somebody, I said, where are you going to start your group? They said, Beijing. And the next person, I said, where are you going to start your group? They said, Dubai. I said, bye-bye, Dubai. <laughs> and, 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 and if you're on social media, put that back up again, would you? Here's what I want you to do. No, send the picture to me, and then post on Facebook, or Instagram would be, really be the best, or, or uh, uh, you know, Twitter, whatever, say, we're studying 50 days of transformation, you can too, and then here's the hashtag we're going to use for the next 50 days, transformed life. That's the hashtag we're going to use. So when you go to any of the, uh, the sites and you s type in the transformed life, you will be able to uh, see what other people are saying about their small group, and you can email me, Pastor Rick at saddleback.com. Now you guys, this is going to be fun but it's gonna be more than fun. It's gonna change your life. If you will do it, if you will hear and read and watch and talk and do, you will grow. If all you do is come to church and hear, you're not gonna be transformed, I guarantee you. You're gonna be no different in seven weeks. But if you will hear it and read it and watch it and discuss it and do it, you will not be the same person in 50 days. You will be a better person. Let's bow our heads.
Father, we already know that you're going to do some amazing things in our midst when we begin this 50 days of transformation. We know that lives are going to be changed. We know that families are going to be strengthened. Marriages will be saved. Friendships will be made. And we know that some people are going to get engaged. We know that miracles are going to happen. It would be a waste of time for us to not expect you to do a great thing. So I already thank you for what's already happening in the hearts of people, and I especially thank you for all of those people who've taken the step of faith, moved against their fear to become a host, to say, I'll start a group of two, three, four, five, six people for the next 50 days. I thank you for these hosts who are stepping out in faith. Help them to realize they're already a success. That doesn't really matter who shows up and who doesn't show up. Because if you're doing it in faith and love, the Bible says love never fails. And so really, Lord, you're more interested in, in their attitude than even in the results. Most of all, I thank you for the cross because we thank you and we do everything we do for Jesus' sake. Now you pray. Why don't you pray this? God, I give you permission to change whatever needs to be changed in my life. Say, God, use the next 50 days to permanently transform my life and to make the, the rest of my life the best of my life. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.